Today we're with Mary Lou Jepson, who's a tech pioneer, a serial entrepreneur, and holds over 250 patents. She's received numerous global awards and was named one of the 100 most influential people by Time Magazine, one of the top 10 thinkers by CNN, and Fortune's 50 over 50. What I thought we would do in this session, which is, I'm an investor, ask me anything, is I'd start asking you the questions. But we'd love to engage the audience. If you have any questions for Mary Lou, please feel free to just raise your hand. They'll give you a mic. And here's an opportunity to understand what's behind being an inventor, what works, what doesn't, and what the future looks like. So maybe we can start with your a serial entrepreneur, and you've just done so much over the last you know, few decades. What inspired you at the beginning? I think it's what inspires all of us as children is, you know, what are we good at? How can we use it? Everybody asks you what you want to be when you grow up. I didn't really know. I just liked basically three things, two things really, math and art. And I grew up on a farm where the tractor was always breaking. My dad was an auto mechanic. I learned how to fix things, which is a really great skill. And so then once you can fix things, you can build things and you can build whatever you can dream of. You really can build whatever you can dream of. It's much easier now with computer science, with AI, with all of these things. But everybody is an inventor. Everyone has these ideas. How do we realize them? And then how do we think about what would actually be useful to invent? And then all of these are processes we go through. And the main thing is the invention really is only 1%. It's a famous quote from Thomas Edison. It's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And the thing that has the impact is all of that perspiration and working with everybody and all the things. The reward is really having this impact on humans in a, in a positive way, of course, for all of us, no matter the field. So fixing and problem solving was definitely part of your upbringing. Yeah, and I think it probably is for everybody on some level. As I was preparing for this, it's maybe people in the audience don't think of themselves as inventors. I think we all are. We are all unique. We all have ideas. Ideas are inventions. I happen to patent mine because I use contract manufacturing and I have to indemnify the manufacturer. So I need a pile of patents because what I design is electronics and because the way it works with claims is like, I'm using this laser with this microprocessor with this piece of ultrasonics. I write those three things. No one's done that before. That's a claim that allows me to indemnify the manufacturer. That's the purpose of them. In other fields, if you figure out how to do world peace, you wouldn't patent that. You would get the world peace done, right? So it's just, it's a strange um, arcane area where I work where it's important to have this stack of patents. But sometimes it's thinking out of the box a little bit. It's not always yeah. linear. Sure. So, uh, Yeah, that's maybe where the art comes in for me. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the crazy things I did, I was making, I was an early pioneer in virtual reality and augmented reality making the world's first holographic video system. Then I was moving all over the world. I was in Australia making a huge hologram that filled a beach cove. And when the moon came into the right position, the whole beach cove filled with holographic data if it wasn't cloudy for 10 minutes, 25 times a year. <laughs> um, and I did the solar, a solar version of that in Germany. And then I thought, well, why not just do the moon? So I designed the projection system to project video on the moon, um, not using lasers, but there wasn't enough light. And I just, you know, you think like that because I was moving all over the world every six months because I did totally impractical stuff that nobody liked to fund that I enjoyed. Um, and that meant I needed to convince some boss somewhere, this is in my 20s, to give me some money to try this crazy project and they would do that. And then, you know, the minute the funding got tight, guess which project got cut? <laughs> it wasn't personal. They liked the project. They just needed to do their core thing. And I'm out over here on the side. So you learn how to swing from branch to branch to do a different thing. But as a result, I would look at the, up at the moon because I was moving to a different place every three to six months. And it, the people I cared about 
we're looking at the same moon. And I just thought, I was so lonely and so isolated that I thought, you know, why not? So I found, I really realized, like, there was, they had these solar energy facilities, these huge um, square meter mirrors that are heliostatic. They're on mirrors, and they basically usually, like the size of these uh, tarps up here, maybe a little smaller, and they track the sun and focus on a vat of water and boil the water to make steam to drive a turbine and make electricity. It was a Carter administration in the US project, but I thought, huh, I calculated like that's enough photons where we can project it on the moon and see it back here if I added a million dollars worth of optics. And I got Pepsi and Coke to compete with me in MTV. This is like the early 90s to sponsor it and like made, you know, like, and then I finally decided a very important thing in inventing, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Like we could have done it. I had death threats legitimately. Should you really project video on the moon just because you could? We're all lonely. It doesn't really solve the problem. So, you know, I let go of it. Plus I had a brain tumor during that time and needed health insurance and things like that. So but I let go of it. But it's an important thing, just because you can do it, should you? And it's something we're facing right now, as we always are, in, in the continued explosion of technologies. So what helps you guide those, you know, what principles help you guide whether you should? Uh, impact, so impact on humanity in what a positive way. So I started uh, an organization as a professor at MIT this is around mid-2005. Like uh, digital divide was big and uh, figured out how to make a $100 laptop. And if you could make a laptop for $100, that enabled kids everywhere, since their school budget for, for books over five years was 100 bucks, they could have a laptop with all the books on it as long as I could make a really innovative laptop because they didn't have access to electricity, so it had to charge itself. So did that. But that seemed like a worthy goal, work on education. Um, right now, I'm curing cancer with consumer electronics, but also mental disease, neurodegenerative disease, stroke, longevity potentially, because we're able to write stem cells, all with components that can be not in next generation smartphones, but in three to 10 years, depending on how fast we execute. And we're curing glioblastoma, which is a 100% deadly form of cancer in humans. So something like that, it's like, look, there's a problem, people are dying. Maybe we could save them, maybe I could save them, because we think about therapies. Our drug of choice for a therapy is a drug but it's at the point where it takes billions of dollars in decades to develop a drug, and in a finance conference, do the math on that. Two billion dollars to develop a drug in 20 years, call it. What do you sell it for? Well, the answer is a million dollars a dose. Who can afford that? I'm so glad to be at FYI and see that one of the top three priorities is equitable, accessible, healthcare for all, not just the million dollar treatments. And for that, you either have to develop a drug cheaper or you can use the fact that light and sound and electromagnetic fields penetrate our body, but do not harm the DNA. Unlike chemotherapy, unlike radiation therapy, we've got safety data for 100 years on 20 billion people. It's not a new thing we're injecting, but we are able, riding Moore's law, the ever, uh, compressing line size and doubling of transistors on chips to be able to modulate the waves and light and sound. And with that, like if this was a wine glass and I sung the right frequency, I could burst the wine glass but not harm anything else in the room. Well, cancer cells have a resonant frequency like a wine glass does. And we've found out what that resonant frequency is by basically taking, in the case of glioblastoma, 16 different lines of that cancer, putting them in human brain organoids and going through frequency sweeps and sonification parameter sweeps to figure out how we could be the, that opera singer and how the cell could be the wine glass. And so we found some sonification parameters that worked, grew up some mice, 
tried it in mice, 100% remission for glioblastoma in the mice, but then we had to sacrifice the mice because the ones we didn't treat, oh, by the way, diagnostic level of ultrasound, lower intensity than pregnant women and their fetuses have been exposed to for the last 50 years. We got tons of safety data. This is not a new drug. It's fraught with risk. It's using something. There's ultrasound in your camera now. There's a camera chip we're using right now in your camera chip to, to, in, in, in your phone that we're using to make holograms with a new laser that we've developed. There's a package of 300 lasers that cost a dollar in your smartphone. So what we're really, and it sounds like a, yeah, sure, that's impossible. Of course it's impossible. Everything's impossible until you make it possible. Our job is to invent, right? The things that we want to make impossible and walk through you know, it's so funny. I walk through my life trying to do these impossible things, and usually people laugh at me. I've come to realize that's a form of flattery, and they say, no, it's impossible. It'll never work. And like, I get it, it's impossible. Part two, I don't know. And could, what would be actually helpful is if you could give me a reason why it might not work, because I'd like to make new mistakes, and maybe you know something I don't know, and have a conversation about why it's impossible, because you get to something more interesting. And so... You just keep doing that and, um, you know, get support. You get a track record and people continually think whatever I'm doing is impossible. But then if I've known them for a while, well, they bet against me in the last two projects and they bet into me and they're like, well, you might be able to do it this time because they see. But I don't know why incremental has value, right, for scale. But if you're going into a new area, why not try something that can have an exponential curve? As if you're doing consumer, like... Luckily, I work in, in chips, and it doesn't make any sense for my chip fabs to sell me a chip for a million dollars. It does in pharma. I'm so happy that it doesn't make any sense for anybody in contract manufacturing to sell me one of something for a million dollars. They think that's ridiculous. They don't want to talk to me. They want to do something at scale, which fits perfectly of our goal to try to save more lives and um, help more people rather than fewer people for higher amount, which is really how the business of big pharma, not intentionally, but it's set up. You're, we're required by law to maximize profits, and that turns out charging a lot and serving fewer people. It's the reality. It's just the reality. Like MRI is 50 years old. More than two-thirds of humanity still lacks access to it. Saved my life in 1995 when I had a brain tumor. You know the cost and size of it 28 years later? The same. Could you imagine that happening in any other field? The same. It's crazy. So we can do something about it. That's physics. Do physics. Hard to fix the magnetic resonance imaging, but you can basically ride Moore's Law and the new kinds of sensors that we can develop with the two nanometer processes we have now made possible by the large investments to, you know, that have been put into our smartphones, next generation virtual reality, augmented reality, LIDAR for autonomous driving. All of that is modulating for the sensors different things. And so riding the manufacturing processes and then tweaking the design to make something that can, um, we also, as we change the frequency, turn on and off neurons by changing the calcium channels, which is non-invasive brain computer interface. It's funny, most people at this point ask me what I think about Elon, because Elon has good PR, he's amazing. But I've had the one inch hole in my head. I did it because I would die if I didn't do it. 1% of people with essential tremor, that's an approved reimbursed treatment to do deep brain stimulation to relieve essential tremor, take it. Because they don't want the one inch hole in your head. So a non-invasive solution, I believe is key for a billion, to help a billion people. I don't see people doing it for fun and drilling, you know, putting all that stuff down in your head. What we're doing is using low intensity ultrasound, super low intensity, the intensity that's in your toothbrush, seriously. And with that, 
we can focus on overfiring neurons or underfiring neurons, which is the objective cause of mental disease. Mothers are blamed a lot for this, or living in a war zone, or whatever you've been through also causes it. And there's solutions to it. But, but the net result is neurons are overfiring or underfiring. We can see that in fMRI, which is the video form of MRI. And we can tickle them and turn them off. And we're doing that in a trial now, as I think I mentioned. I'm sorry, this is my third talk today, so I'm not sure. Um, we, um, Basically, two-thirds of our patients are going into remission for severe treatment-resistant depression in a study we're doing right now at University of Arizona. That study's ongoing, it's not done, but we've tracked them for four months, and they're still there. This could also work for addiction, neurodegenerative disease, and it tracks on something that's been used and approved for a while called transcranial magnetic stimulation which doesn't, you can't focus the magnetic field precisely to the overfiring neurons. It only has a centimeter and a half of penetration. We can go anywhere in the brain or body. Mm -hmm. We can do that with stem cells where, I don't know if I should mention this in this crowd because it's lunch, but um, 400 women with urinary incontinence were treated with their stem cells in that area, fixed the problem. It's unpublished yet with a collaborator. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you wouldn't think to do that, but like, that's a real problem, and we don't want anybody to have. They were older women. Um, but also, we can, you know, address a bunch of issues like, you know, back treatments, anything. If you can activate the stem cells, it's, it has a rejuvenating effect that we can use, and we can. We're showing we can activate them. Mary, we're out of time, okay. unfortunately, but if anyone has questions after the session, we'll be right back. Thank you for coming. Thank you.